So we want to have a question answer time now. And uh, I'll go through the questions one by one. First question is, <clears throat> I feel like my Christian life is an up and down life regarding sin. How do I remain spiritually motivated and have a continuous overcoming life? The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. And he says, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Jeremiah 29. So <clears throat> it all depends on how earnestly we seek after God. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And the reason a lot of Christians have an up and down life regarding sin is they are very half-hearted in their pursuit of holiness and the overcoming life. And then, of course, if sin is not serious for them. I mean, think of it like this. Supposing you had a serious sickness, say some type of cancer, for which there is a cure somewhere in some part of the country where a doctor has always cured people with that type of cancer. How seriously would you try your best to go and meet that doctor, whatever the cost, whatever the expense, because you value your life? I don't think most Christians look at sin in the same way as they look as a diagnosed, if they were diagnosed with cancer. So that is the main reason why many people have an up and down life. They're not seeking God earnestly. You, I mentioned that in the previous session about knocking and knocking and knocking. And the second is that they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not seeking for the power of the Holy Spirit. They are trying to overcome by their own determination. And God allows us to fail so that we learn that we cannot make it on our own. So... We need faith that God will fill us with the Holy Spirit and we need to seek after God with all of our heart. And the other thing I want to say very important is to be absolutely honest in relation to sin. If your conscience convicts you about something, honestly con confess it and seek God earnestly. I believe God will. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's the verse that helped me to come to an overcoming life. Then you must believe Romans 6.14. Sin cannot have dominion over you when you are under grace. And 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, God gives his grace to the humble. So you put two and two together. If you get grace, you'll overcome sin. Romans 6.14. Why didn't you get grace? 1 Peter 5.5. 5. You're too proud. Ask God to show you where there's pride in your life, which is preventing you from getting grace. So how do I remain spiritually motivated and have a continuous overcoming life? This is how it is. I also want to encourage you to read God's word regularly and meditate on it. Even if it's only 15 minutes a day, don't try to read huge sections. Go to the New Testament and read a small section and meditate on it and say, Lord, speak to me. It's better to read 10 verses and spend 15 minutes in meditating on that than to cover many chapters. Because Psalm 1 says, whoever meditates on God's word will prosper. Those are a few suggestions. And seek to keep your conscience clear all the time by confessing as soon as you're aware of any sin. And then you will come to an overcoming life. Okay, next one. How can I maximize doing profitable things on a daily basis? The basis of 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 23, where it says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. How can I maximize doing profitable things on a daily basis? See, in the previous chapter, 
chapter 9, it says about how people take part in an Olympic race. Say a person's preparing for the Olympic marathon. How does he run? It says here in 1 Corinthians 9.25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do this to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I run in such a way as without, not without aim. I discipline my body, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and make it my slave so that I'm not disqualified. So it's, it's, it's after that that he goes on to say that in verse chapter 10, 23, I choose the things that are profitable. So he disciplines himself in various things, you know, in uh, eating, for example. It's a very, very good habit to discipline myself in how much I eat. In other words, not live to eat, but eat to live. So it's one of the areas we all love food. And Jesus spoke about fasting. And I found in my younger days, I would, as a discipline, fast one day every week. And if you haven't ever done it, start with one meal a week, start then go to two meals a week, go to three meals a week and fast and seek God. Set apart some time to seek God earnestly and say, Lord, show me the things where I'm wasting my time, wasting my time or wasting my money. That's the other area where the Lord told me to be very careful. If you have plenty of money, give some of it for the Lord's work, help the poor people. And be disciplined in how much you spend on yourself. So if God sees that we are serious about these things, particularly the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, and our discipline in eating food, and discipline even in our sleeping habits, that we need sleep, and I believe we all need to get a certain number amount of hours of sleep. But all these things, if we are disciplined and lazy, and not lazy, then we'll find that we spend our lives in a profitable way. And for that, ask God, if you're not sure about something, say, Lord, please show me. Should I spend time doing this? Or should I give it up? There are habits which don't give you any spiritual profit at all and uh, don't even help you mentally or physically in any way. We need to eliminate some of them. Okay, another question is, how do I bring up my children in this perverse world? These days, young children are cheeky and disrespectful to their parents, their attitudes and words. My child knows it's wrong, and I'm asking God to give me wisdom to bring them up in the fear of God. Now, the thing is, it's all a question of how soon you start disciplining your children. I believe you should discipline your children before they are one year old. Because a one year old child understands one word. If you strongly say no, I found even a one-year-old understands that. So you try it out. <clears throat> You'll find if you firmly say it, if you say it in a weak way, it doesn't. But if it understands a firm word, you're not going to do that. You give it a tap on the hand or something so it knows you're not supposed to do something. <clears throat> if you discipline your children, right from the beginning of their life and never allow them to speak disrespectfully when they are two, three years old. Don't wait till they are 10, 15, that's too late. If they speak disrespectfully when they are three years old, you say, you're not gonna to speak to daddy and mommy like that. You can punish them depending on the severity of it. Sometimes I would punish my children by saying, go and lie down on your bed. You can't go and play any games now. You can't play with the other children in the house. You lie down in your bed for half an hour. And that's a punishment for them. You don't have to spank them always. So <clears throat> teach them to respect their parents from the earliest age and to obey. When if you tell them to do something and they don't do it, you say, you've got to listen. Otherwise, you're going to be punished. And sometimes we need to give them a little spanking. The Bible says, that uh, if you use the rod, you can bring up, save your child from hell. So 
it's those who have been careless and allowed their children to do whatever they like for the first six, seven years of their life. Boy, they don't have problems almost all their life with that child. So it all a question of how early you start. If you start early and you're strict and you're consistent, I believe you can bring up children who are respect, not only respectful to parents, but respectful to older people and who have a very good testimony in the church. So it's not enough to ask God to give you wisdom. That wisdom is already in scripture. Train up a child in the way he should go. He will not depart from it. So the Bible says. And read the scriptures to them and tell the stories of the scripture to them. And when they are old enough, you can get them a children's Bible that they can read themselves. Then you ask them questions in it. You know, a Bible with a lot of pictures in it. A picture story Bible. Very good book. And then you can ask them questions in it and get them to know the scripture as well. Okay, the next question is, how do I preserve my marriage these days when there are so many divorces among believing Christians? Well, part of the reason why there are so many divorces among believing Christians is because they go to churches which accept divorce. We don't accept divorce in CFC churches. We will never conduct the marriage of a divorced person in our church. If a person who's already divorced in his unconverted days and gets, comes to our church, we'll accept him. He was ignorant. We receive him. But we will not conduct the marriage of a divorced person in our church. And how do you preserve your marriage? First of all, take what God's word says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 onwards about God's standard in marriage. The husband is the head of the home. If a woman does not want to make her husband the head of the home, I have one advice for her. Don't ever get married. Simple. You can be the head of your life as long as you like. But once you get married as a Christian, you have to be submitted to your husband you say, what if my husband is not converted? Well, if he tells you to do something against the word of God, you've got freedom to say no because God is above him. But otherwise, you must submit to your husband in anything that he asks you to do, which is not against God's word. It's a place of a wife. And at the same time, a husband must, if you're a Christian husband, proceed with all your life, with all your heart, to build to, uh, you know, to build a fellowship with your wife is very, very important. If you don't build fellowship with your wife, you're not going to be able to love her as you should. So love your wife. You must pray, Lord, please help me to love my wife as you have loved me. That's a command. Work towards it. So <clears throat> let me say one word in conclusion in this matter. In Ephesians chapter 5, in the last verse, it says, a woman must respect her husband and the husband must love his wife. The two words there, the Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. Each husband must love his own wife as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. What is the most important thing your wife wants from you? Your love. What is the most important thing your husband wants from you? Your respect. You will not have a divorce if you seek to follow these things. Okay, next question. How do we raise up a future generation of brothers to share God's word in the meeting? Well, it's very difficult to find people who are serious about studying God's word. We have to encourage them to, you know, we have so many resources in cfcindia.com for those who want to study God's word. They can, you can spend three years studying the teaching we have in God's word, verse by verse through the Bible, all that Jesus taught, and so many things that are there. If you spend 15 minutes a day, that's it. You give up 15 minutes of your sleep every year and discipline yourself. You can really get to know the word. 
And without knowing the word, you cannot, you, you cannot effectively share God's word in the church. So all we can do is encourage people to hear God's word. And there must be a lot of teaching of God's word in the churches. And if on Sundays, it's only two or three who share, then you must have some weekday meeting where others also can come together and everybody gets an opportunity to share maybe two, three minutes. You take a passage of scripture or listen to a half an hour message and get everybody to share two, three minutes. In one hour, you can have a very profitable meeting. You get everybody to share two, three minutes. What did you get from that? Get them to open their mouths. That's a good way to encourage people to begin to share God's word. And then as they study the word and they seek for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God can raise up people to minister the word in the church. This is a, yeah, an unusual question. What is one advice or exhortation you'd give to the church in CFC in Melbourne? Well, it's the same advice I give to uh, every church in the, every CFC church in the world. All men will know you're my disciples when you love one another. And that's the advice I give to every CFC church. Love one another and God will bless you. And you've got to love God first if you want to love one another the way God wants you to. How do you avoid legalism? In the church, this is the next question. Well, legalism is <clears throat> something that creeps in very easily. People become Pharisees when they don't pursue love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you try to keep the commandments without loving Jesus with all your heart, you're definitely going to end up as a Pharisee. And so we must emphasize in the church and you must emphasize in your own life, the primary thing is from, I must love the Lord with all my heart. And the Bible says, don't judge others. That means don't condemn them. Don't compare yourself with others. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, Sorry, not 1 Corinthians, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It speaks about those who, verse 12, compare themselves with each other, measure themselves and compare themselves with each other. One, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. It says they are foolish, they are without understanding. So it's when you, if you refuse to compare yourself with another person and don't think of yourself as superior to the other, that's one easy way to avoid legalism. Because legalism comes when you think you've got, you're doing something and that guy's not doing it. And you begin to judge him. Follow the Lord yourself. Obey everything that you see in God's word. And then leave the others and to God to, take, to guide and lead them. Another question is, if I gossiped about someone behind their back and they didn't know about it, is it the right thing to go and say sorry to them as a sign of repentance? You have to be very careful here. I'm not going to tell you whether you should say it or not say it. It depends on whether you feel the other person knows about it. If the other person, you're sure the other person knows that you are going gossiping me or gossiping about him or her, you must definitely go and confess it and say, I'm sorry for what I did and make sure you don't do that again. And if you have a problem with somebody in the church and you don't feel free to go and speak to that person directly, you should go and speak to the elder, not to somebody else. If you feel somebody's doing something wrong, go and tell the elder about it. If you're not able to speak to that person directly, the best is if you have freedom with that person himself and you go and speak to him and set it right there. But if not, go to the elder and speak to him and tell him what you saw or what you feel is wrong. But gossip is a thing we have to be very careful about because it will ruin our own life if you gossip. 
Because when we gossip, we are hurting somebody. And we destroy ourselves when we hurt others. You know, I've often said there are two types of sins in Genesis 3 and 4. Genesis 3 sin is where you hurt only yourself. Adam hurt himself by eating of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. He himself got punished by God. Eve got punished by God when she disobeyed God herself. That's a Genesis 3 type of sin where you hurt yourself. And God did not curse Adam or Eve. He cursed the ground. But you go to the next chapter, Genesis 4, where you have a sin where Cain hurt somebody else. He hurt his brother. He killed him. Or any other way you hurt him, even with gossip. There, God did not curse the ground. He cursed Cain. Very interesting to notice this. God never cursed Adam in Genesis 3, but he cursed Cain in Genesis 4. Why? Because Adam sinned, hurt himself. Cain hurt somebody else. So when you hurt somebody else, God sees that as a more serious sin than where you hurt only yourself. Cain was cursed, cast out, and told you'll be a wanderer forever. Now, give me, let me give you an example of things where you hurt yourself. When you smoke or drink or come drunk into a church, you hurt yourself. And you'd say, that's a terrible sin, that guy's drunk. That's Genesis 3. He's hurt himself. But what about when you gossip against somebody else? That's worse than getting drunk. It's Genesis 4. You hurt somebody else. In one case, you hurt yourself. If you see somebody smoking and say, oh, what a terrible Christian. But you see it's one Christian gossiping and you don't see that's worse. When a man smokes, he hurts himself. When he, he smokes, he, when he gossips, he hurts somebody else. No, distinguish between Genesis 3 and Genesis 4. And God took Genesis 4 sin where you hurt others much more seriously. Gossiping is worse than smoking. Not that smoking is good. That's bad too. But gossiping is many. I mention it like that just to show you that many people don't see it. So please take the sin of gossiping very seriously. What is your personal opinion on homeschooling? This is an individual matter. Some people are able to manage having the children at home and one of the parents has the ability to teach, it's possible. But if a person doesn't have the ability to teach or doesn't have the resources or the finances for getting videos and books and all that, then that may not be possible. It's an individual thing which we have to be careful about that we don't make laws for other people. Maybe you can do it in your home. But certainly, if you're able to do it in your home, it appears as if homeschooling is better these days in many places because there's so much of evil in the public schools. They, there are young children, 10 years old, who are watching pornography and showing it to others and all types of bad habits among the boys and girls. And a lot of sin coming out of this. So. After a certain stage, once they have come to say they're 12 years old, it may be good if you establish them well in the faith that they can go to school and learn how to mingle with others because we want our children to learn to function socially with others also. And if, they only keep, if you only keep them in home school all the time, they won't know how to do that. They need to mingle with people who will make fun of them and bully them and um, do all types of things, you know, um, and stand up to them. But they may not be able to do that when they are five or six. So unless it's a very good school, depends, these schools are different. But I would say the main thing is, depending on how, how your children are, how capable you are of being able to teach them at home, and what type of school is available locally. Okay, next question is, how can I... Uh, I think we already did this. Okay, we'll go to the next one. What is your advice on raising boys in this evil time? I think that's more or less covered in what I said earlier, to teach them to obey and teach them respect 
older people and teach them God's word. And when your boys and girls come to the teenage years, you have to speak to them openly about sexual sin so that they are careful about that because if you're going into a world where teenagers are always talking about filthy stuff and you have to warn them when they come to that stage <clears throat> in life. Okay, next, another question is, <clears throat> I was reading an article where we are told not to struggle against flesh and blood. And it's convicted that I shouldn't have expectations from anyone, even in our marriage partners. Well, that's not the meaning of don't fight with flesh and blood. When Paul says in Ephesians 6, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against evil principalities and powers. What he's saying is we must fight the devil and not fight human beings. We should not fight with human beings. That's the meaning of not struggling against flesh and blood. Don't get into an unnecessary argument with people and don't get into a fight with people about anything. Not even, I don't even get a fight with people about doctrine. I explain a doctrine, but if people want to come to a fight with me, I say, sorry, I'm not going to fight about it. If you're humble enough and you seek God, he'll show you. Because understanding of truth comes by revelation. So, <clears throat> if you, Ephesians 6 12, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against evil forces, the forces of darkness. So, what I have taught in this connection with this, and what I've experienced and practiced in my own life, is if we fight with human beings, we won't have power to fight the devil. That's the meaning of that verse. And what the Lord said to me from that verse is, you must concentrate all your energy to fight the devil. So determine that you don't waste any of that energy to fight with any human being concerning anything. Yield. Don't fight. And I've tried to follow that policy even with Christians on doctrinal matters or anything. I don't want to have a fight with anyone. And <clears throat> if somebody wants to come and fight with me, I say, sorry, I'm not interested in the fight you can go your way. I'm not interested in convincing you about anything. And as far as possible, avoid conflict with anybody. And if, you, if you're a man of peace, you'll find that other people will respond in the same way in most cases. I remember, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I rode a scooter in, that's the only thing I could afford, in Bangalore for 42 years. And uh, <clears throat> scooters are such that sometimes, you know, in the tight type of traffic there is in Bangalore, it's easy to sometimes accidentally collide with someone. And when they collide, it's very easy for you to fall off. You may not get hurt, but you just fall off the scooter or the scooter falls down. And <clears throat> I've seen that whenever that happens, there begins a big yelling match right there on the middle of the road between the two people. And I found that also, even if I accidentally touch somebody or he would immediately start fighting and supposing I, supposing it was his mistake and he came and banged into my scooter. Again, he'll get up and shout because the rule is whoever shouts loudest is right. And so he begins to shout. And I've learned through the years, and even if it is my mistake, or his, even if it is his mistake and he came in the way and hit me, I will immediately say, sorry, sir, please forgive me. Ah, his attitude changes immediately. He doesn't want to have a fight. He says, oh, it's okay, even though it is his mistake. But I avoided conflict. I found that word, I'm sorry, sir. Or a madam, I'm sorry, madam. If you hurt somebody in any way, you find it brings a conflict to an end pretty quickly. I've seen that, but it's very difficult for people to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say it. And <clears throat> question goes on to say, when I have expectations from others and demands, I prove that my kingdom is of this world and he's given place for Satan in his heart. And such people are doomed to live a miserable life. This is, he's quoting from the article. So my question is, what does it mean to have ex no expectations from your marriage partner or even from brothers and sisters in Christ? Can you please elaborate? 
I don't believe we should live expecting others to do things for us. Well, I believe in a good marriage. Your wife will certainly know that she's got to do something. But if you have to have a fight with your wife to get her to do something, <clears throat> not worth it. I think she should learn from your example. So I believe a husband can set an example by doing things beyond what is expected of him to, if necessary, shame his wife into make that means by shame his wife means make the wife feel ashamed that she's not doing things that she should do. That she's ashamed that she's not doing and maybe gets up and sees your example and does something. That is a better way rather than expecting and being disappointed and uh, then leading to fights and arguments and yelling and all that. There is an answer in Christ to everything. <clears throat> God doesn't force us. You know that. He doesn't force you to be, even to go to heaven, even though that's the most important thing of all. He doesn't force you to live a godly life. And I don't believe I should force anybody. You can't force your wife to obey you or force your wife to do this or that. It doesn't get anywhere. It leads to a fight. You have to show them, if you're a Christian, you show them from scripture, this is how God wants us to live. And then pray that God will, if your wife is not submissive or your husband is arrogant, pray that God will change them. Let me show you a verse of scripture to support that. In 1 Peter, in chapter 3, it refers to a, a woman who's got an unbelieving husband. An unbeliever. Husband is an unbeliever. Not born again. And the wife is a believer. And it says here, same way, in the same way, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. You wives, be submissive to your own husbands, even if they are disobedient to the word of God. That means I'm not saying that you should be like a doormat and let him just walk over you all the time. <clears throat> Understand it in the way, in the spirit of what it's written. So that even if they are disobedient to God's word, they can be one to Christ without preaching to them by the behavior of your wives as they see your respectful behavior. The emphasis here is on re a respectful attitude between husband and wife. Respect your wife, respect your husband, and ask God to guide you in, if you're having a difficult marriage. Mm -hmm. Here's another question now. I feel like my Christian life, okay, this is, we've done this. How can I put God first and seek my career goals? Well, that's possible by saying, Lord, I'll never do anything unrighteous. <clears throat> I'll never sign a false statement. I will never tell a lie. I'll be faithful to give the number of hours of work I should work in the office, not cheat on the number amount of time I should work in the office. I will do my work faithfully to the best of my ability. <clears throat> That's putting God first. And in many situations, you may advance in your profession. I know Godly people who have done very well in their profession by never compromising their Christian principles, always seeking to stand for the truth of God's word and even being a witness in their office when the occasion arises. We're not to go into our office and preach. No. I was in the Navy and I didn't go around preaching to my, even when I was working in an office in the Navy. I could hang up a calendar with a verse, a scripture verse on it. Nobody would stop me from that. I could put that in my, I could keep a Bible on my table. Nobody can stop me from that. I'm not preaching openly, but I let everybody know I'm a Christian. There are ways in which we do it. And uh, I got a lot of opportunity to witness to many, many, many of my fellow officers and human sailors about Christ. So, and it did not hinder my career because every ship I served in, the commanding officer always gave me a very good report about my work because I did my work faithfully and I could advance in my profession. 
I got good reports every time, even though I did not join them in their drinking and smoking and gambling with cards and all. The commanding officer saw that I did my work properly. So there's no, there's no need for a conflict between putting God first and your career goals. And in some cases, there may be bosses who are very much against Christians. Then you say, Lord, I'm willing to suffer loss because I'm a Christian. I will not compromise my conviction. And if I lose something in my career or my prospects because of my Christian conviction, I say, Lord, that's, that's nothing. I'm glad to sacrifice that for the sake of being a witness for Christ. Okay, next lesson is how do I learn patience and trust in God? regarding my life and career goals and ambitions? Well, it's connected to the previous question, I suppose. We must believe that promotion comes from the Lord, that's what it says in the Psalms. And he raises up some, he puts down the other. And if I'm faithful in my work, I may not reach the top of my profession, but I'll advance to the level to which God wants me to reach. When I joined the Navy, I was not born again. And I did well in my training years, and I was top of my class, and I had my ambition to become the Admiral of the Indian Navy. There's nothing wrong in that. And I worked towards it, and since I was top of my class, I said, okay, I'm gonna get there. But then I found after a while that if I stood up there, I was born again, then I discovered that if I'm going to put Christ first in my life and be upright in everything on the ship and in the office, there are a lot of things that are done in government offices and even in the military services which are not upright. There's a little bit of crookedness. People are seeking something for their own and they ask you to cooperate with them in doing something wrong. Or in, in my case, in the ship, for example, there's a lot of drinking that goes on in a ship. And when the, my senior officer asked me that, so you're the officer to appoint it to order all the whiskey bottles to be brought into the ship for people to drink. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I'm a Christian. I cannot order that. Disobedience in the military is a very serious crime. But somehow God protected me that I, he did not send me to jail. You know, you can be sent to jail if you disobey a senior officer in such matters. And God took care of me and protecting me. But I said, Lord, I'm willing to suffer anything, but I'm not going to compromise my conviction. I will not do what is wrong. Another time, I was asked to write something false in the report. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot do that. Well, the officer was upset with me. And within half an hour, he transferred me from there. Okay, that was inconvenient. But it's fine, I'm willing to be transferred. So if you're willing to suffer these little inconveniences, God will make sure that you, you don't suffer more than he has decided you should suffer. But if you want to be a Christian, uh, you may have to give up some of your career goals if you have to compromise. But in some cases, you may be able to have your career goals as well. Another question is, how do I see God's will regarding whether to take a new job or to move to a new city? Well, God doesn't say, you know, speak from heaven, but it's more by peace in our spirit that we know it. There's a book of mine called Finding God's Will. And I've expanded on this, so I can't give you all the answers here. But if you go to our CFC website, cfcindia.com, and go to resources, and in there, there are books. And one of the books is Finding God's Will. You can read it freely online. Or you can buy it from our Bangalore bookshop, um, just write to cfcindia.com. And there I've said how we understand God's will by uh, using our mind, putting God first, saying that I don't want to take a job which is going to make me compromise or where I'll have to do things that are unchristian. Or if you want to move to a new city, like it says here, Ask yourself your motive. What is your motive in moving there? And ask God to guide you. And finally, God will, and seek the advice of godly people. That's a very important thing. 
godly people around you, seek their advice. And then, by peace in your heart, you will know whether if God gives you peace in your heart, that's an indication that of his will. That's how he shows us his will. The next question is, is there a chance that we could lose our eternal salvation? So the next question is, is there a chance we would lose our eternal salvation? We need to understand what eternal life is. Our understanding of eternity is something that will never end. But that is not the definition of eternity. Eternal means that which had no beginning and has no end, both. And only God has eternal life. And so eternal life, Jesus defined it in John 17 and verse three like this. John 17 verse three, he said, this is eternal life that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is not length of life at all. Jesus defined it as knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. So that knowledge comes through repentance and faith that Christ died for my sins and rose again from the dead. Now I can begin like that and the Bible warns us in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. Brothers, he's talking to brothers, verse 12. Brethren, let us not live according to the flesh. He's not talking to unbelievers here. So then, brethren, verse 12, we are not under obligation to the, live according to the flesh, but, brethren, if you live according to the flesh, you will die spiritually. You'll go to hell. So there are verses like that that tell us that you can be a believer and then lose your salvation. See what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, he says, the last days are going to be difficult days. And he says here that there's going to be so much of sin, verse 12, lawlessness, sin in the world, verse 10, many will fall away. They will deliver you to tribulation, verse 9, and you'll be hated by all people in verse 9. And that time, many will fall away. Many believers will fall away, lose their salvation. And There'll be so much sin that people's love will grow cold. Love for the Lord will grow cold. But, listen to this, Matthew 24, 13. The one who endures faithfully loving God till the end will be saved. What about the one who doesn't endure to the end? He won't be saved. One more verse in Hebrews in chapter 3. It says in verse 12. Brothers, he's talking to brothers, dear brothers, be careful that there doesn't come in you an evil, unbelieving heart that makes you fall away from the living God. Those verses are very plain that if you don't walk with the Lord, you can lose your salvation. Eternal life is not living forever. It is the life of God. We saw that in John 17, 3. Our definition of eternal life is what confuses people. It's not length, it's quality of life. Eternal is not referring to length of life, but quality of life, John 17, 3. And you can lose that if you don't keep clinging to the Lord. Another question is, can you explain about Melchizedek? Was he human? Melchizedek, we read, is a priest in the Old Testament. You read about it in Matthew. Uh, Genesis 14, and uh, it's a picture of Christ, just like David is a picture of Christ. And uh, there are 
the lamb that was slain is a picture of Christ. There are many pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. The serpent put on the wilderness is a picture of the cross of Calvary, where people looking up to the cross are saved. So Melchizedek as a priest who helped Abraham, and he was a king and a priest, which is never there in the Old Testament. Nobody was a king and a priest in the Old Testament except Melchizedek. They could either be a king or a priest. But Jesus is a king and a priest. So that's why he's called as an order of Melchizedek. He was a human being and a picture of Christ. Okay, the next question is, what does the Bible tell us about wasting food? Well, we should not waste anything. We have to be careful that we uh, are careful with money, especially we shouldn't waste money. And wasting food is like wasting money because food costs money. So it's a matter of being disciplined. We, my wife and I have always been very careful. See, we, when we came to skip out to serve the Lord, we had given away all our money uh, to the Lord's work and we had very little. And we lived with very little month by month. And we had to be very careful in our home about eating and buying clothes and everything. So we had to be very careful. And it's a good habit to be disciplined in the way we spend our money. Those who are wasteful in spending money are indisciplined. It affects many areas of their Christian life. We should not waste food. But don't judge others. Judge yourself. You make sure if you find other people at the table are wasting food, don't judge them. You just take care of yourself. Think of all the poor people in the world who have nothing to eat. Tell your children to, about them so that they don't waste food. What does the Bible tell us about putting on makeup, men and women? Well, I don't judge people on that. It's, to me, it's like combing your hair. Well, why should you comb your hair? Or why should you wash your face? And people would use some perfume to avoid or some type of thing to avoid any stink coming out of their body. And that's, that's okay. I'm not here to judge anybody else. Each, each person must decide for himself. We must not be ugly. We must be dressed properly. But when it comes to makeup, you can go to extremes in this. And I would not like to judge other people on this. It's a question of why do you do it? And all these difficult questions, I would say, ask yourself one question. Why are you doing it? Is it to make yourself presentable so that you're a good testimony for Christ? Good. If it's to, it's to attract people, girls dressing up to attract, be very careful there. God doesn't call us to put makeup on to attract people to ourselves. So I leave that to the individual. I'm not going to judge. Okay, another question is personal. One of my parents is not born again and has made a lot of financial wrong choices and now expects me to support them financially. I only have enough money to support my own household, so how should I approach it? Now, I will not tell you what to do because you go and tell your parents, Brother Zach said I shouldn't do this, I should do this. No, don't quote me. I would say this is an individual thing. It depends on how much you earn and how much you can afford to give. Certainly we must care for our parents and help them if they have taken care of us, they've educated you, enabled you to get a job. You must, even if they were foolish in many financial choices, if they enable you to get a job, you can provide for them in the measure you can afford. But you certainly need to care for aged parents. I believe that is God's will, that we should give back what they gave to us in our childhood. So that is the Christ-like way to approach it, but we can't make a standard rule on how much you are to give to your parents. How can I fellowship with my unconverted husband? Yeah, we read that in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, obey him, as it says there, and let them see one. Let me read that again. 1 Peter in chapter 3. You wives, be submissive to your husband, even if he's disobedient to the word, so that you can win them without a word, without your preaching, just by your respectful behavior. That's the answer to that question. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. By your respectful behavior, seek to win him, pray for him. 
and uh, over a period of time, maybe he'll be converted, we can't guarantee that. I have a young boy who, a son who says he wants to be a Christian, and wants to be good, but he can't be good. Yeah, that's right. He can't be good. You must ask him to pray that God will help him. Uh, and he, that he needs Jesus to help him. That's very good. Can he be born again at this age? Sure. I believe he can be born again at that age. And how do I know if he's born again? Well, anyone who's born again, there'll be a change in their behavior. They won't become perfect. You're not perfect yourself. And so how do you encourage him at this stage? Well, you encourage him by asking him to read the Bible, get him a story Bible or something, to read the Bible every day and uh, to obey his parents. The one commandment for children is, children, obey your parents. Uh, and that's what they need to take heed to. And that's the best thing you can teach your children and it'll go well with them. And then, and, and have fellowship with that children. You know, what I used to do was, I had four sons, and I would, once in a month, take one of them out on a date, just me and that boy and that son. And we go out somewhere and have fellowship together. Maybe sit somewhere and have a little something small to eat somewhere, or some type of area where we can have time together. And once a month, they would look forward to it to build a relationship between me and my son. And I did that once a month with each of my children. And I would encourage you to do that, build fellowship with your sons and daughters. Another question is how can we reignite a first love in marriage? Well, you have to love Christ first. And if you love Christ, even if your partner is not interested, you can win that person slowly by being patient with them, with him or her, and loving and serving, denying yourself, and showing Christ by your life. You can gradually win your partner over. It's not a 100% guarantee, but that's the way you do it. And then pray that your first love will be restored. And you know, very often we lose love because we have a lot of expectations. Give up all expectations. Expect nothing from your partner. Say, I'm called to serve. And gradually that person may respond, ashamed of their behavior and respond in a positive way. Sometimes it may not work, but you, must, you can do your part. Okay, uh, another question is, can you explain to us about the heaven? Where is the third heaven? Well, Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is where God is. Oh, sorry, the other way around. The first heaven is this universe that we see. You know, the sun, moon, stars, and billions of miles of space is the first heaven. The third heaven is where God is. Paradise, Paul went there. So between the two of them must be the second heaven where the devil is. And the devil was cast out of the third heaven and he's not sent to hell. He was sent into the second heaven where he does not have access to the third heaven, but he has access to the earth. You know, the demons come down here and hurt a lot of people. And finally, one day, he'll be cast down to the earth and thrown into hell, into the bottomless pit, uh, and then into the lake of fire that we read in Revelation 21, 20 rather. And so, that is where the third heaven is, and that's where Paul was caught up. And that's where we, where, when a believer dies, that's where he goes, to third heaven, to paradise, and that's where Christ is. Okay, now is the last question. I kept this to the last because it's unimportant. Why does a woman keep her father's name in a marriage? Well, it's a custom in society, usually, for a woman, when she gets married, to take her husband's name. And it seems to be right because she's saying, I'm submitted to my husband. I am Mrs. So-and-so. But it's not a sin if she keeps her father's name for some reason or the other. There may be some reason why she keeps it. I don't know. If she submits to her husband, as a wife should submit to her husband, that's more important than what name she keeps. But 
You can say you're Mr. So-and-so, but you don't submit to Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> it's no use just having changed your name. Well, that completes all the questions. I tried to fit it all into one hour, and I hope you understood the most important things. Love God with all your heart, saying soul and strength, read the scriptures regularly, and ask God to help you to love your fellow believers as Jesus loved you, to be merciful to others, to be patient and kind, and say, Lord, read 1 Corinthians 13 and see what love means, and say, Lord, help me to be like that. Let 1 Corinthians 13 be characteristic of my life. And I believe that God can build wonderful churches there in Australia. God bless you all. Thank you for listening patiently.